Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for April 22nd, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Read Plus. Pardon. Today's topic is Read Plus, a cybersecurity framework for research data at Purdue University with Preston Smith and Sean Vest. Preston is the Director of Research and Computing Services at Purdue. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. Uh, first, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, just click on the little chat icon and type your questions into the window there. And we take questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand it over to Preston. Preston, welcome. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Let me find my presentation here. Okay. I have too many windows open. Well, while Preston's uh, pulling that up, Sean, why don't you go ahead and briefly introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sean Vest. I'm a research security analyst here at Purdue. Uh, I primarily work with the secu uh, central security office and then we have a dotted line that uh, we work with the regulatory affairs office as well. Great, thank you. And Preston, I can see your slides now. Is it the right, is it the right display? Uh, go, go, go back to the uh, other there version. Go. Yep, okay. go ahead. Thank you. All right. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Preston Smith. I'm the Director of Research uh, Services and Support at the Research Computing Organization at Purdue, Purdue University. And I'm going to talk about Read Plus, which is our name for our, our cybersecurity framework for research data. So just in terms of outline for what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to go into a little bit of background on, on how we've gotten into the regulated research business at Purdue. Uh, as I'm sure many of you can probably relate to, uh, control and classified information has been one of our drivers in getting into this space. I'm going to talk about the administrative processes that we've learned around the university in the process of supporting CUI and all the additional challenges that this, um, that this work has dug up for us to work on. Um, so in response to all of our experiences working on CUI, we created this Read Plus ecosystem. Uh, but we're going to talk about the vision. We received an NSF award uh, last fall to advance it. We're going to talk about the project's goals, what we've gotten done so far, what we've learned, and what we're going to work on next. So uh, in a general sense, I'll we'll talk about the regulated research at Purdue. So in support of ITAR, we've operated a small enclave cluster uh, for ITAR contracts. Um, it's just been a small version of one of our normal high performance computing system. It's in a very small limited physical location uh, with access only to US persons. It provides uh, data storage for ITAR projects that uh, people can only get to with SSH keys and from known locations and all those, all those, all those normal things for supporting ITAR. And then in 2015, which I think this is probably the case with, with many of you, uh, a re researcher who was using our ITAR system with an existing contract uh, received a new, new requirement for compliance with uh, DFAR um, 7012 and therefore all controls in NIST SB 800-171. Uh, we've had a couple of these come through in the past and the sponsor, uh, after going back and forth with them, was, was willing to negotiate on that because we could say we had these controls in place. But in this particular situation, the sponsor uh, uh, was not willing to negotiate on the requirement. So we built a new solution to, uh, to provide support institutionally for NIST 800-171. Uh, it was dub dubbed READ. This is the re research um, environment for encumbered data. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, the short timeline, lack of physical places to put this, we, we built our solution in Amazon GovCloud. Um, every project has its own enclave. It uses the Purdue VPN. And, you know, I don't need to go through all the controls that you need to have for NIST 800-171. That could be a whole talk all by itself. Uh, but the key takeaway that we learned from working on this, on this particular 
uh, project was that we de we developed all of the controls to be compliant with with uh, NIST uh, with with technical answers. So the experience on this, um, you know, no, no matter what pain points we found on this, the key point is that we were compliant in time for that December 31st, 2017 deadline. We learned in the process of doing this that the solution was very expensive. Um, the AWS uh, 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 instances were, 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 uh, were, were costly and uh, unpredictable. Uh, we, we built a rate based on full cost recovery of all of the, the added security effort for providing the data security. Um, it wasn't very flexible, uh, but most importantly, it didn't leverage any of our existing processes or expertise. We'd, we've done high performance computing for a long time here at Purdue and our open systems are, are well automated, easy to use. There's self-service tools for people to get on there um, and, and much of the workflow for onboarding pro products or provisioning resources is fully automated. By doing this in AWS, we were unable to leverage any of this um, sort of stuff to our benefit. Uh, we don't do a lot with AWS at, at Purdue. I know many other institutions are probably further along with, with using AWS for all sorts of, of uh, university IT, but we're not. Uh, and it was hard for us to grow an AWS expert in the process if we aren't doing it anywhere else. But really, the, the biggest takeaway for, for this environment and, and, and how successful it was, that it was very onerous to the researcher. As you can imagine, if you're imp implementing controls for all of your 800 um, items with technical answers rather than policy or, or, or compensating controls, it's not going to be terribly user friendly. So since this experience, we've been working on, on re-implementing our 800-171 solution. We're redesigning it, we're re-implementing it on-prem so that we can leverage those processes and the experience of doing our community clusters. So in the course of doing all this, um, we noticed a number of pain points of potential gaps around the university. Um, our export control office is very mindful that regulated data subject to CUI may, may at some point include um, things that are not research. Student data, administrative data may be treated as CUI at some point, and certainly other sponsored research uh, fields. Like agriculture, for example, is one that's in this, this, the CUI register and is something that we might need to be aware of. Um, the read AWS for defense information, which is the main use case to date, is secure and well managed, but it's expensive. The VPR and, and the CIO had to subsidize it, and it's hard to operate. Uh, our, IT uh, our IT staff had to review every um, security review, uh, which would cause delays in getting people onboarded. Uh, and in a broader sense, uh, there's not a, not a great picture as to where controlled information and non CUI controlled information sits around the university. There's departmental IT, there's, uh, there's, there's custom solutions built out there uh, for, for individual projects. All the security was reactive. And it's, and it's difficult to answer industry sponsors' inquiries on, their, on your cybersecurity protocols. We had experiences where a, a sponsor from the aerospace industry was doing fundamental open research on one of our HPC systems, but since their IP is involved in some form, they wanted to be very clear about how our systems are secured and, 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 and how we're gonna keep their data or methods safe. You know, they did not require CUI, but having, you know, being able to point to a standard like NIST would have been very, very beneficial to us. Um, and finally, one, one of the things that, you know, that we learned in the, in the course of doing this is that all of the, the data classifications um, you know, that's uh, sensitive, uh, restricted, and public information, all the owners of data types, the process is all written primarily with administrative data in mind, not so much research. So for export control processes, uh, for, for building read, we, we learned that we had a, a relatively well-defined process. Um, a contract comes into Purdue, uh, the, the sponsored programs, uh, contract people see keywords that might say ITAR, it might say uh, CUI, whatever the keywords are, they know that when they see a contract coming through with those, they sweep it into the export control office where there is a team who is dedicated to ensuring compliance and, and moving these, these projects through the, through the workflow. Uh, they'll, they'll look at the technology, they'll look at the, uh, all the controls that are needed, they might get involved in negotiations with the sponsor. Um, there, they bring in the export control team and the, and the IT security team to design a technology control plan. They may need a general guidance document. But th the nice thing about this is by having Reed or our general ITAR cluster, we know that there is one system that we can point researchers to and, 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 and give them a roadmap for what they're going to need and how much it's going to cost. However, outside of export control, it wasn't quite as well defined. 
um, every, every other research project, data use agreement, data security plan, were manually performed, uh, non-repeatable, and it's a one-off exercise. We would have, we have three or four uh, IT staff doing security reviews, and, every, and if you think about this, every time a contract comes in that says, I have a HIPAA project, I have, I have a CUI project, I'm gonna work with FERPA data, uh, I have an IRB and get, need to get a data use agreement to get it from somewhere else, this, the, the security staff had to review those contracts and treat all of these things as a one-off solution. So the data, data use agreements is one example. They're performed by these security analysts and we see both de-identified and, uh, and identified data. And again, it's not just PHI, we get many other types of data. Uh, so the security staff has to work with the local IT team, perhaps in the, in the individual department like statistics or chemistry or something like that. They work closely with the researcher uh, and, they'll, and they'll produce a one-time guidance document and then it's up to the researcher to maintain compliance. Here on the central side, we have no visibility necessarily into whether they actually are being compliant because they're, it, the onus is on them to manage and operate their own uh, solution for, for regulated data. Uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's lots of other agreements that come in as well. Uh, we'll get a new master user agreement from, uh, from a partner or an agency. Uh, where these get executed is not consistent. Uh, sometimes they come from the, the, the sponsored programs office. Sometimes, depending on maybe it's the scope of the, of the project or the, the level of importance of the, of the sponsor, the central legal counsel is involved. Sometimes procurement has been involved with these. You know, basically, if there's anywhere where there's a person that can sign a contract, uh, we might see agreements coming through that might affect people's data security. And then again, obviously, the data sharing from other universities for data use agreement and, and uh, IRB data is very common. So just to tell, tell a, an, an anecdotal example, uh, we had, it was probably two years ago now, a new faculty member joined Purdue um, in our nursing department um, in, in the fall. Uh, she had gotten her PhD at another institution. I don't remember which one it was, but that's not too, too terribly important. But she was going to continue her research as a new assistant professor with data that she was working on from her PhD. So she had a data use agreement that was worked out. The IRB at her previous institution worked with Purdue. They made the agreements to get, get the data here, but it was human subjects data. I think it was, it was even covered by HIPAA. And we, we realized that there's no default answer for this type of data. So she worked with one of our IT analysts um, for many months, uh, back and forth with the analysts, back and forth with IRBs from both institutions, uh, just to get the data from her institution to Purdue. You know, her first response was, I had Box at my other institution. Do you guys have Box that we could just transfer the data? Unfortunately, we did not. So that would, you know, that would have been, been an easy answer. And they wound up settling up on an encrypted DVD that was FedExed across the country, uh, put on an encrypted hard drive that she keeps in her office, and then promising to delete that DVD once it was copied onto the encrypted storage. From end to end, that took her seven months from the time she started her, her job as an assistant professor until when she got her data to a point where she could actually start doing science. So the larger landscape at Purdue is driving, uh, it made it clear to us that we needed to come up with an overarching framework. You know, there's many front doors for researchers to get, get into Purdue with regulated data. Uh, we'd see contract, uh, contracting workflows in a number of different places and with varying levels of complexity. The, the security analysts spend an inordinate, inordinate amounts of time uh, doing data, data use agreement and data security reviews, you know, rather than proactive things. The pre-award staff, the people who, who are working with researchers to get a grant uh, set up and started and proposed, they're largely not aware of all of the things that they might need, to, might, they might need to be cognizant of on regulations, or even knowing that there's a cost to, to some of these solutions that the proposal should include in a budget. Um, at, the, at the back end, uh, the IRB staff and faculty work together without having a roadmap to refer to for appropriately handling data. Uh, it's left to the faculty member to find something and then the IRB to decide, yeah, I think that's probably an okay answer. Uh, Purdue has a fairly decentralized IT organization. Uh, we sit in the central IT organization, uh, we being the research computing group and our IT security colleagues. Um, but there's, there's IT groups in each of the major, major colleges like agriculture or engineering or science, and then individual staff in each department down to the level of like the chemistry department, the biology department, and so on. And all of those distributed IT staff, um, they have varying levels of familiarity with the compliance needs, what things we have on campus, um, how they might relate to each other, and many of them um, have had to roll their own solutions. You know, we learned in the course of, of finding out what was out there that our statistics department, for example, had 
two or three servers, standalone servers that they operate just within their department to hold HIPAA data. So all, all of this gap discovery led, led to the creation of Read Plus. Uh, so we, we, we dubbed our AWS environment um, Read as a research environment for encumbered data. But we like the acronym so much, we shifted it a little bit. And Read, Read became a research ecosystem. So our, our export control office, um, our, our, our export control officer is, has been a big, a big champion in coming up with a, with a unified framework for working with, with research data at, at with uh, regulated research data at Purdue. And she, and she laid out this vision, which is, has, has survived largely unmodified. So her vision is that we, just because a researcher is doing encumbered data, uh, we should not give them a, 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 an environment that's smaller, that's less capable, that's less uh, useful, and, and more expensive than, the, than what they would get if they were doing open research. So we wanna be able to efficiently and cost effectively handle research data and do it in a manner that's compliant with the highest level applicable to unclassified data. So in the course of working on this, we knew this was a project we were going to have to do one way or the other. So uh, last year we, we uh, submitted a proposal to the, the CICI uh, solicitation with NSF and we, we were awarded. Um, a project to, to build the cyber uh, cybersecurity framework for, for research data at Purdue. So the project had four goals, three of which we'll talk about here. Uh, the first one is that we're going to educate the researchers on the regulations and the impact of cybersecurity uh, for, the, for their work. We're going to give them resources to train them, the regu require, regulatory retire requirements coming from their agencies, how they should be prepared to handle it, uh, how do they map their agency requirements to the appropriate campus cyber infrastructure resources. You know, if they're, if they're doing, for example, uh, you know, defense simulation, they need to know that our regular open community clusters are not the right solution for them, but we have other things for that. Or if they want to store HIPAA data, Box uh, could be a solution for that as well. And we want to empower the larger campus IT, both central and distributed, with a standard framework for data security. Uh, so we're going to create a, a campus framework based on NIST 800-171, and this will allow us to, to to support future regulations that may come around and for building a new capability that we did not previously have for supporting HIPAA. Uh, and then finally, um, this one is, uh, it looks shorter, but turns out this is a, a larger, large piece of the work, is we're gonna improve processes for research administration. We wanna create a single process for taking in uh, research projects, executing contracts, and facilitating mapping of the cyber infrastructure resources uh, for the SPS office, for human subject, and the export control office. So where to begin? So there's five or, uh, five or six major topics that we've been working on since our award in September. Uh, first one is to determine the regulatory framework, uh, create a common language, uh, build relationships and communication, evaluate the administrative processes out, out there around the university, uh, deliver awareness training, and uh, what we've dubbed is creating a, a clemency window. So on a, a common uh, regulatory- Yes. Uh, Apologize. A quick question: Is yes. the data is data lifecycle management part of this big picture NSF award? Um, that's a good question. I don't. That, it wasn't specifically targeted as one of the deliverables on that, but I think we do touch in touch into that. Sean, do you have any 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 comments on that? Yeah, I think we are looking at doing data retention guidelines as we're adopting new projects. So I think that will help with the data lifecycle management of, mm -hmm. of these projects. Yeah, we, we, we do cover data lifecycle management on the export control side. For the, so for the CUI, we did build in a, a, a process for archiving data and preserving the data at the, at the end of a project. Uh, but yeah, as Sean says, it's not really in place for, for non-export controlled projects, but it is something that at least some recommendations are being pulled, put forward. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so as we said earlier, uh, we, uh, we foresee uh, CUI regulations touching more than just uh, defense info and more than just research data. Uh, so institutionally, we've settled on using uh, NIST 800-171 as the framework for, for doing, uh, doing our cybersecurity. Um, we're, we will align or at least document the cyber infrastructure resource configuration against that standard. You know, this will help us both for supporting actual regulated research or, or being able to, to work with our, our, our fundamental research 
to a security minded sponsor and tell them that, yeah, we are, this is an open system, but we do uh, align all of, all of our, our systems to the standard, you know, and, and there is control in some capacity so that they can refer to that without us having to do a, you know, 30 or 50 page security survey for each sponsor. Then we're going to use the 800-53 standard for applying the missing controls to uh, HIPAA align a, a resource. So in the common language, uh, one thing that was missing uh, in, our, in our institutional data, data classifications um, was ones that, that directly apply to research. Now we have really have three uh, classifications, public, sensitive, and restricted data. And when you look at these on the Purdue website, they all talk about things that look very administrative. There's you know, payroll information, there's student data, grades, uh, all, all that sort of stuff. And nothing that really ties specifically to research. Um, we have the notion of fundamental research on, on the research side. Uh, we've got data that are applied to different, different levels. Um, export controlled research with US persons requirements is a higher level of security than, uh, than HIPAA data, but our, our institutional, our, our, our official levels don't, don't map to that. And they don't really have a, a, a common language for talking about the access restrictions. So we can, we can point to this table that we see here on the slide and, and know that um, uh, access levels and the data types for, for HIPAA um, are largely the same as, as the ones for CUI, with the exception that CUI has the requirements for US persons only, uh, no OFAC countries, but a lot of the things under the hood are the same and they just get more secure the, the, the larger, the, the lower that they go down on the table. So on the, along the align, alignment process, um, we've already had, since the grant started in September, we've already seen benefit in, in our experiences in supporting CUI, helping out the larger institution. Uh, we, got a, we, got, we got a quick win by, by developing an enterprise side and research side uh, unified control sheet, uh, working with uh, the chief information security officer, internal audit, Purdue Legal, on using that same standard to apply to our administrative systems. So at the, currently, our enterprise IT organizations are, are performing 800-171 gap analyses, analyses on their various systems uh, on the administrative side. Uh, so that's just documenting their, their, their current state. And we're forming a consistent message around, around the risk. And this will allow everybody to use the standard templates uh, using a standard uh, security questionnaire to talk about things. So well, I've already seen a, a, a noticeable impact in the use of our common language. We talk about our level one fundamental research all the way up through level four export control and what exactly resources that we have in there um, and, and talk about it in these terms of these levels. This framework's language has already, has already started to percolate its, its way up you know, to, to the CISO and to the board of trustees, which naturally are very, very concerned uh, and interested in cybersecurity, managing Purdue's risks and keeping our IP safe. So it's been very rewarding to see our, our language that we've been developing in this getting presented to our trustees. But building relationships has been one of the more interesting pieces of developing this framework. Uh, we, got, we started our grant in September um, and, and by the time we started the grant, we had a, a good relationship with our export control office um, and IT security and research computing and some of our academic units like engineering who, who had more of that, of that, of that defense um, ITAR covered research. So we knew, our, knew each other pretty well in that space. But in the larger sense of this IT security, research computing, uh, we didn't have any, exi any existing relationship with the staff that runs our IRB. We didn't know the, the, the players and the leadership in our sponsored programs pre-award office. Uh, we didn't know the group that actually executes the contracts in, in, in sponsored programs. And we didn't even know the leadership, um, the, you know, the relatively senior level leadership in our Office of the Vice President for Research. Our research computing group sits under the CIO uh, rather than, than, than the Vice President for Research. So these connections have had to, had to have been formed uh, after the beginning of this grant. So we began getting this larger group together in November in, uh, of 2018. And we had you know, eight to 10 people all, all in the room you know, discussing how do, these, how do these contracts flow around the university? Now you can see the one, our, our first whiteboard and trying to make sense of how all, this, how all this stuff works, where we see a contract come in, where it goes to a, a contract analyst, um, then maybe it goes over to the IRB, and then there's side channels where things go back and forth. 
um, then sometimes it goes back to the beginning. And it was very, very enlightening hearing all of this stuff. We even learned that there's a person uh, whose job it is to do regulatory compliance in the sponsored programs office. Uh, they didn't necessarily work directly with, with us in research and they didn't work with people in our uh, IT security organization, but we're, we've learned that now we've got some, some resources and people that we can, that we can uh, reach out to. So building this relationship has, has allowed us to identify gaps in all the processes. You know, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the process for export control data in ITAR has been relatively well understood. So if you go down the columns here, um, when a contract comes in that has ITAR, they bring in the export controlled office, they look on the cyber infrastructure menu, they see a thing for, for doing that. Um, an award comes in if it's applicable. They get a technology control plan, they get onboarded onto the AWS read, and everybody gets on their way. However, when you start looking into, into other regulations, it gets much murkier, and we find a lot of opportunities for things to identify improvements. Uh, the contract in, uh, analyst, if there's a HIPAA project, who do they bring it to in the, in the beginning? Is, is, there, is there an office that controls those? Um, what about non-HIPAA but human subjects uh, projects? How do we get them squared away early in the process? We don't know. Is there a menu item for, for people to, to get, get data storage or computing resources for their budgets uh, on either HIPAA or human subjects data? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the IT security analysts had to do tons of work for building data security plans, designing a one-off cyber infrastructure solution that are oftentimes based around encrypted hard drives. Um, and then where do they, where do they get on the cyber infrastructure? If the IRB project gets this far where they need to get the CI, um, they have a data use agreement. Uh, sometimes they don't have a data, a data security plan. So they have to go all the way back up to the beginning look at the contract and then start the process all over again to get mapped to an appropriate piece of cyber infrastructure. So this has given us a lot of opportunities to address. You know, one of the big ones is, is who oversees, um, regulated contracts and data use agreements for things that are non-export controlled data. Um, there's, a, there's an office in, in one of our sponsors of our Read Plus ecosystem that leads our export control office and, and they see all these things that come through there and they function as a concierge moving them through the process. But there is no equivalent role for people doing HIPAA data. Um, there, I believe there, there, there may be an opportunity and, and maybe some movement in the near future on some organizational changes in the VPR's office to fill that gap, which I think would be a big win. Uh, out, out of all of the things that we've, that we've identified with this framework, getting, you know, getting the organization evolved to support that would be a big win. So we clearly need to uh, predefine a menu for appropriate cyber infrastructure solutions for, for different uh, regulatory requirements. Um, we've seen several opportunities for adjusting staffing, defining roles, defining interfaces, improving processes and filling gaps, and of course, having more meetings and conversations. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a little gratifying that we've, it's been, it's been maybe a month or two since we've had a conversation with our larger group on the research administration side, but it's a little gratifying that they actually just reached out to us a week or so ago asking when the next time it is that we're all going to get together. So I think that, that tells me that they see some value in it as well. And then finally, this is, you know, this is kind of an obvious one, but it's, a, it's one of those organizational questions that, that are hard to answer. We clearly need a one-stop research compliant website uh, developed so the faculty or, or the research administration can go through and find all of these sorts of things and, and, uh, and we can keep information moving out throughout the university. But where exactly does that need to sit? Uh, we need to sort that out. Is that, is that a research computing uh, job? Does that need to be in the Vice President of Research Information Assurance Office? Should it be with our IT security stuff? Does it need to be on all three? These are all great questions that we're going to have to sort out. So when you look at the larger process for how you get a, get a regula regulated contract in and executed and moving forward to do research, from the PI's view, it's a, it's a little terrifying. Um, navigating all of these connections, um, the onus currently is on the PI to, to deal with all these sorts of people. You know, he's working with pre-award and budgets and uh, uh, the contracts directly. Uh, he's talking to the sponsor. If he needs computing and he knows about research computing, he might be working with us. Uh, he has to work with the regulatory affairs office directly. Uh, depending on what exactly is happening, the regulatory affairs offices may be working directly with those of us in research computing. You know, certainly they're working with the security office and then we're talking to the security office. Uh, and then their departmental IT has to be in on this, but this is, as you can see from the, the from the frustrated scientists there, this this could be a lot to have to have to sort out and manage yourself. 
So what we would like to do is to give them just a high level process with a simple roadmap and a linear process. They can get a page with a bulleted set of lips, a bulleted set of lists that they can operate in order, march down, they get the contract, they get their data, data security plan, they get moved into the, the read ecosystem, they get their awards, set up their IRB, and then do science. And I think, and I think we would be successful. So at a high level, uh, will look something like this. The PI, all they have to know is that they're working with somebody in the pre-award phase, the post-award phase, and all of us in the background will have all the connections in place from building these relationships to work between IT, research computing, the regulatory affairs, and so on, uh, both the pre-award and post-award phase. So this will help us with a lot of, a lot of, lot of different things. We can, we can build uh, at the post-award phase, have, have predefined templates for data security plans, uh, defined communication channels, um, have, have uh, con consulting options from security, research computing, research administration, all there operating out of the same playbook. So certainly awareness and training is a big piece of this. Uh, so we've been working hard to be building partnerships by training. Um, in, in, in fortunate uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fortunate timing, we signed an institutional agreement with Box to support uh, data sharing and collaboration for HIPAA data uh, right at about the same time that we were beginning this grant. So getting the training and awareness put in place for our HIPAA researchers to use Box uh, was a perfect opportunity for us to start piloting some of these, uh, these training needs. Uh, we've had to work with the contracts office, the, the vice president for research regulatory affairs office, IT security, all to teach them about the data security uh, language, about the security levels and access levels, uh, building uh, training for the team in the IRB and the contracts office, um, giving, uh, setting up channels for direct communications. Uh, then those of us within IT, we've had to train as well. We have had to do, you know, do security training for everybody in our, our research computing group, uh, design things uh, with, uh, with security in mind, doing risk reviews, uh, training the teams. Um, all, all in that common message and, and all the things that the research needs to think of. Did, did, I, did, I, see the, did I see a question come up there? Uh, we have someone who's raised their hand, but unfortunately uh, they can't speak. So if they could just uh, type the question and we'll just continue. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, so our, the, the, the fourth goal of the uh, of the Read Plus grant uh, was to develop cybersecurity professionals. Um, we, we, we designed a lot of the work in the project plan for, for building our, our research framework along, along the, the lines of, of using undergraduate students for doing a lot of the work. Our undergraduate team have been involved deeply with creating the training content, delivering the training, uh, doing controls al alignment, uh, doing uh, tabletop exercises, um, and they'll, they'll, be, they'll be working um, perhaps doing some uh, some more in-depth technical things, doing programming, creating the websites, and then this has been, been great for them. Uh, they, they, all, they all get an opportunity to acquire real-world experiences. They get to work with real security professionals at Purdue. They get to work with real researchers doing, you know, doing all the exciting things that, that are happening at the institutions, and, and are getting the opportunity to do poster and paper opportunities at conferences. This was just a week or two ago where our students were giving a, giving a presentation for our, for our own cybersecurity uh, center here at Purdue about the framework that they've been developing. Uh, I think they, they, they even, uh, be, between this project and a related one, they, they won some, yes, uh, more, than, more than one award on, on their posters. So uh, we, we, we recognize that this is certainly a, a work in progress. And we, we, when we work with researchers, you know, we wanna be clear that we're, to the researchers, that we're trying to, we're trying to move things forward one step at a time uh, together. Uh, so we, 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 don't, we don't profess to have all the answers. Uh, we don't even profess to having all the questions at this point, but we, we, we want the research to feel comfortable that we're learning together. Um, but the key things as we've been, as we were working closer with them is that we just need to plan to track the risk. This has been a, this has been a, been an important thing um, as an example uh, for our, for our HIPAA researchers getting on using Box. Um, we've, we've had to go back and forth with them a lot of times to understand the risk of using, uh, per, for example, personal laptops. Um, this, this caused some consternation with some researchers because they think, oh no, now I have to buy with my grant, you know, X number of laptops for my researchers. Uh, which ideally, yeah, that would be the great, the best thing for you to do for your for your uh, regulated research data, but we can't really expect them to spend that type of money if they don't have it. But but um, but 
noting it as a risk as something that they need to be thinking of and maybe for the next time and getting that fixed going forward has really been the one of the one of the deliverables um, we need to be flexible during the adoption plan ahead when we can and make sure that everybody is comfortable with the process uh, if they're not comfortable you know we're not we're not going to be successful uh, get that feedback uh, share it make changes and and and, and evolve. And this early, one of the key messages to all the faculty is we're more here to consult and solve your problems. We're not here to enforce things. We don't want to tell you that these are the rules and shut you down and make it so that you can't do science. We want to, we want to empower them to, to move forward in the most secure way possible, but not at the expense of them being uh, not productive. So lessons learned. You know, there's been, there's been a lot uh, so far. It certainly um, isn't a smooth or linear process. Uh, moves and fits and starts. Um, if you if you look at the whole list of all the things to do, it does feel like boiling the ocean or or eating an elephant, uh, depending on your choice of metaphor. Uh, we've had to build relationships. Uh, we're finding more relationships that we hadn't thought of that we need to develop. We need to discuss processes with lots of people and map them out and get some consensus built on on how we are, how we're going to fix them. Um, First, you're going to see increased anxiety and then increased tooling. Our data security questionnaire, when we go to onboard a project and map it to a security level, has created some interesting conversations. Um, when, when researchers get a questionnaire about their data, um, you know, it's, it's a relatively simple thing. We just want them to answer some, you know, just give us some facts about the data and, and what it has in it and, and, and any any regulations behind it, but this just created a surprising amount of anxiety. They see a, a scary looking security questionnaire and, you know, they, I think they jump to a, they, they jump to conclusions about what, what may, you know, what that may mean, mean to them. So we, we're, we're, we're talking among ourselves about how to make a data security uh, questionnaire in a way that's not scary, but still gets the information that, that we need. We have a couple of questions yeah. here. Okay. So we, uh, one question here is, um, I think it, might be about the previous slide, I'm not quite sure. Uh, is that to say you have mitigating means that permit the use of personally owned computers for HIPAA or 800-171 work? Uh, certainly for 800-171, like that, 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 that one's a hard no. Um, uh, that, 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 this might be another another one for Sean, but we, we 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 do try to work with them when they have those type of types of problems to come up with alter, alternative solutions. Uh, as an example, I think the the one I was referring to was how, uh, they wound up I think working with their department to to get some additional funding to provide some Purdue owned laptops for them to work on. Uh -huh. And then another question here, uh, organizationally and politically. Who is driving these changes and getting engagement or buy-in from the staff who will be affected by the new process? So the main people that are driving the processes are, it's a, it's a combination of our, of our uh, research information security office and the vice president for research and the chief information security officer. Um, so they, 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 they work closely together, um, but certainly from the, from the research side, they've got, you know, they've got a great deal of support from the vice president for, of research and the CISO uh, has, you know, Cybersecurity is very high on the mind of our of our of our trustees uh, at, at this at this point in time. So between the two of them, we've got some fairly fairly high level investment, in making sure that this is successful and all of our IT solutions are 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 in alignment. Thank okay. you. Please continue. Okay. Um, so we found a couple of opportunities where where it's where it's very beneficial to find efficiencies. Um, if, if the opportunity is there, we've tried to organize and do the security re reviews at the highest level uh, possible project level. For example, we've got a very large uh, research initiative. You know, it's, it's larger than a project on the, on the order of $50 million uh, or so with a, you know, with, a, with a private company here in Indiana. Um, but within that project, there's five or six different research initiatives going on and 15 different PIs, um, all of which, if we look at those individually, you know, that's a lot of data security training. That's a lot of data, you know, data reviews. That's a lot of uh, moving pieces to keep all that all that happening. But in the course of having these conversations, we learned that, that we can engage with that overall initiative at the top level where they already actually had some data security training, they had some data security reviews and some uh, established data security best practices that were already in a, already agreed with with their sponsors. So we were able to work with the leadership there, come up with one one set of answers for all those sorts of things and set them up with one uh, one solution for the entire project to use. 
Um, we, we've gotten benefit from partnering with other areas who are trying to do similar problems from different angles. You know, for example, our internal audit was reviewing campus systems and they were able to leverage the work with, with doing 800-171 for the combined security controls for, uh, for enterprise and research uh, systems. Um, the, going out and doing all the trainings and meetings and to onboard researchers has been very illuminating. Uh, the gap in between policy and actual practice is bigger than you would think. Uh, we've found researchers handling data the same way that they were instructed to when they started 15 years ago because you know that's how their advisor did it and that's how that you know their advisor's advisor did it. Um, or you you give you give the presentation on yeah you should you should store your data like this you should not do this but then you can see on the back end that they're immediately doing some of the things that they um, you know, that they're advised not to, you know, not, not using the, uh, you know, the sync client, for example. So these all result in having to go back and forth and really retrain the people on and get that information to stick. So what's coming next? We're what six months into a two year into a two year project. Uh, one of our next projects is going to be performing a baseline assessment of our researchers' cybersecurity and regulatory awareness. You know, so what do they know about the requirements that their sponsor puts on them? What do they know about what's in their data? Um, and we're looking at a couple of, of surveys that have been done out there in the larger community over the last couple of years, and maybe build build on those or or, or deliver those as well, so we don't have to invent our own uh, assessment um, a tool. We're going to align additional systems and, 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 and teams in the IT organization. So we want to prepare additional research cyber infrastructure to support regulated research. So that we, for example, to align one of our HPC systems to support HIPAA for uh, human, human genomics, for example. Uh, we want to automate the workflow. Uh, can we take advantage of our automated tools for provisioning and granting access and managing access and tracking things in the hands of individual PIs if, if the regulations are appropriate or at least into the uh, hands of the information assurance staff. I would much rather have a world where our export control office, where they're, when they're shepherding a contract through, they get to the point where the researcher has the award and they need to provision a compute resource. I would love to just give them a button where they can push it and the researcher gets their, their, um, their CUI computing environment, where we don't have to pass tickets between three or four different IT staffs and manually set things up. We want to generalize the framework and disseminate it uh, in forums like, like this one and, and elsewhere so that others can learn about what, what we've been doing. Um, it, 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 I don't know, it feels a little bad to say that uh, we need to formalize the governance. Um, it feels like that should be something that's done earlier, but, yeah, but as, as we've been building the relationships and understanding who all needs to be in, in the picture, it was giving us a much, a much better picture as to what that uh, eventual gov governance that will emerge by the end of this project uh, needs to look like. And another twist that we just really in the last uh, couple of weeks realized that there's parts of the research lifecycle that happen at the pre-proposal -pre uh, phase uh, that we need to build awareness with. Uh, there's a team in our vice president for research office that helps with grant writing. Uh, they, they work and write the proposals and, 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 help, and help the PIs uh, be successful from that end. And there's an automated pre-award worksheet system where, where the PI can start on their, on their proposal before it, uh, before it actually enters the system and starts to exist. And there's checkboxes in there that's, that say, are you going to be using these core facilities? Are you using research computing? There's a couple of vague questions about data security. So I think there's some opportunities in there for getting uh, data security questions into something before a proposal even gets submitted. So that those can be on our radar for keeping an eye on before they show up uh, at, at the point where something is awarded and the contract is coming in. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'll let you say your thanks, and then we'll get okay. to questions. Great. Yeah. So that was my that was my last slide. So I'd like to you know thank you know thank the team that we've been working with uh, so hard over the last last you know couple of years making all this possible. Our our, our full time staff that have been working on. Um, on, on the Read Plus program, uh, Carolyn Ellis, who's our program manager, uh, Sean, who's on the line here, and er Eric Adams, who's been leading all the training and students. And then Ben Cook and Jess Ackerman are our, our undergraduates who, who have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting for uh, developing content. Um, and we've had a we've we've had a we've had a great engagement so far working with with a with a team from Trusted CI, um, Andrew Adams and Anurag uh, Shankar, uh, have been helping us uh, work through some of these issues and and articulate some of the things that we need to be uh, addressing going forward. So that's been been very valuable working with them. So I I, I appreciate the the help from Trusted CI. So with that, I think I've got a little bit of time for questions, and we can see how that goes. 
Yes, uh, so I'm going to start reading some questions and then I'll try to switch back and uh, run through some trusted CI news while people are typing. So uh, one quick question, uh, would you share the tools that you're developing with the rest of the community? I would think that we will. Um, okay. I, I, I don't know that, uh, that that might be Sean. If we do, we have if we have anything that would be in, in, in a state right now where it's ready to be shared. But I think certainly by the time this project is is complete, that's one of the things that we do want to have as a resource for the community to, to learn from. Okay, uh, let's go on to a couple more longer questions. Uh, hello, it seems that you mentioned that Purdue uh, was planning to move from AWS to on the premises or on-prem, I think that's premises, to utilize the already existing compute resources. But I don't believe you talked about how you would handle the changes necessary to your standard HPC systems on campus or to the other infrastructure to adhere to 800-171, et cetera. Did I miss something? If not, can you talk about that or is it sure. still in development? Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. There. Yeah. There's certainly. There's, there's a lot more detail that I could go into about that particular topic. Yeah. So we're we're not actually going to uh, make all of our existing HPC systems uh, uh, aligned with 800-171 and and do our CUI on on those. But we are standing up a small enclave uh, that will that will be uh, aligned with 800-171. Um, it will have a lot of the technical controls that we have in AWS, but implemented on physical hardware, and it will have. Uh, have the appropriate uh, physical safeguards in place. We're using a a, uh, a, a, a small locked data center with, with appropriate power. It's gonna be on isolated net network segments. It'll still use the same uh, VPN environments with a geolocation, all that sort of stuff that we have on read, but just implemented on, on, on physical hardware in an enclave. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here, is there a form of off-ramp, meaning the procurement is a 3D printer or desktop software, no cloud component, et cetera, in which a lower level can decide is not, it does not require a full on review. How do you define that? That's a good question. Sean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so we, we are seeing those types of reviews today. And again, they're at Hawk um, and we're looking at them each individually and coming up with a set of controls. A lot of these are like phase one beginning research projects. Um, and as we move through this framework, we're keeping in mind that there's going to be a phase two where we're going to have to incorporate, you know, the remaining IT, which is going to be a lot of lab equipment. So we don't have a complete answer today. I think it's going to be similar to everybody else. Either it's going to be some segmented, segmented network or air gap system, et cetera. Great. Thanks. Thanks. We got well, another question in here. Uh, what challenges did you run into identifying researchers working with CUI? and other forms of restricted data, and what departments slash schools are you seeing that are most involved in that research? So, so C, CUI, fortunately, has been one of the, the, the more manageable ones. We had the Export Control Office already in place, uh, and they had their, you know, their, their, their fingers into the process and, and seeing, uh, seeing any contracts or CUI research coming through. So those have been hard to, hard to slip by, so that's been fortunate. Um, the vast majority of them are from our College of Engineering. Uh, they've been from mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering are really the big, the big two. Uh, so our, our College of Engineering IT staff has been, has been, a, been a, good, a good partner in all this effort as well. Uh, they've had to build, um, they've had to build uh, CUI capabilities more from the endpoint level. So it's been, it's been a good complement to our, our central cyber infrastructure, and then it allows them to focus on the, on the endpoint that the researchers are directly touching. Um, but on the, on the non-CUI side, that has been, that has been absolutely a, a, a big challenge. Um, finding out what researchers, for example, has, has, have HIPAA data there, you know, what IT solutions that they're using to, to deliver it. And it's been a lot of, it's been a lot of uh, turning over rocks, so to speak. Great, uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, go through a little bit of trusted CI notes and uh, updates, and then we'll, we'll just let a few more questions queue up in the chat. So um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and those of you who are attending, uh, we'd like you to take our survey for this presentation. And uh, we're asking you to fill out the survey to give us some feedback about uh, what you learned, and also if you have suggestions of other topics that you'd like to see presented, we would like to hear from you. So please take advantage of uh, letting us know 
uh, through the survey. And then um, uh, we have our trusted, our trusted CI is hosting a cybersecurity technology transition to practice or TTP. You might have heard of that thrown around. Uh, it's a workshop on June 19th in Chicago. For more information and to request an invitation because seating is limited, uh, please go to our TTP page, trustedci.org slash TTP. Um, also, for those of you who are attending uh, and are also attending PERC, we will be at PERC July 28th through August 1st in Chicago. To learn more about PERC, uh, you could go to their website, perc19.perc.org. Uh, we will also be uh, sending out more information as the uh, proposals are approved and the, the schedule gets out. We'll be sending out more information about where you can find us during the, uh, the conference. Also, quickly uh, save the date. The NSF Cybersecurity Summit is October 15th through 17th in San Diego. Uh, so if you would like to uh, meet with pe uh, people, members of the NSF community involved in cybersecurity, uh, please look into attending our uh, summit. And then finally, um, about Trusted CI webinar series. To view our presentations, you can join the announcements mailing list or submit requests to present. You can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is May 20th at 11 a.m. That is, a, that is earlier than we usually do it because Memorial Day is on the 27th. So please come find us at, on the 20th. The topic is robust and secure internet infrastructure for scientific collaboration. And our speaker is Amir Herzberg. And I got another question here. Uh, have you received any pushback from Purdue researchers in that they believe this is more work than their project requires? How do you handle bringing the researcher up to speed? If you're talking, you're still yeah, on mute. I was, yeah. I was still, I was still muted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, cer yeah, certainly. You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody can imagine that. You know, that there's, we, we certainly have gotten feedback from researchers saying, you know, that this, this is too much to deal with. Uh, I shouldn't have to worry about this sort of stuff. Uh, the people who are doing like real, real CUI, um, they've, they've not done very much of that. You know, their feedback has basically been on the level of, no, I know I need to do this, but this is probably too onerous. But that, but that's been good feedback. So we've been able to, you know, make the make the user experience better for them. But we've certainly had researchers. The, uh, uh, from the non-CUI space, uh, as, as HIPAA is one example, where, where they just uh, they, they just wanted, from their view, they said they just wanted to get onto Box and to have to go through and do a data security questionnaire and do a brief training to, to be blessed to move forward was just, in their minds, uh, too much to deal with. I mean, but which, I, which I can get. There's a, there, it's, there's a, a reasonable amount of, of truth to that. So we're hoping to address some of that by uh, making the training more accessible, making it online, perhaps where they can just do it, whatever, do a do a uh, a web certification to get checked off, uh, much like the official uh, HIPAA compliance training, so that we don't have to schedule sending our staff out to the, you know, to the researcher's lab and and get that all coordinated. And it just at least lower the lower the barrier as best we can. Great. Um, final call for questions. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I just wanted to point out that I really appreciate you taking the time to explain that there were all these re university resources available and this project kind of uh, forced you guys out of your, uh, your, your little communication bubble in a sense and, and take advantage of some of the help that's available. I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I, it's been it's been really useful. Um, just you know, to plug something in the future, uh, we're going to be at the Educause uh, Security Professionals uh, Conference uh, here later in May. We're, we're going to do a panel about, you know, in a general sense, about that particular part of, part of the equation. Uh, one of our colleagues from Penn State has a nice talk where they where they uh, go into great detail about building those connections and building relationships. Um, one of our colleagues from Iowa is going to participate as well and talk about the, the the how they've filled the gap on the research facilitation end uh, on, on on regulated data and how all those things you know tie in together to solve these these parts of the research compliance world that aren't really the IT problems. Yes, I, I totally agree. Oh, that, that I'm sure that'll be a, a pretty uh, exciting uh, conversation. Um, so let's do a last call for questions. I haven't seen any new ones come in yet. Uh, what day is the Security Pro presentation?
<laughs> um, I believe that is the 15th of May, I think. I'm looking, looking to see if anybody's giving me a look like I'm wrong. <laughs> it's either the 14th or the 15th. I would have to, I would have to double check. Oh, Jim uh, posted a link to the events ah. page. Great. Yep, that's, that, that's the one. Thanks, Jim. Great. Okay. Well, um, again, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, thank you, Preston and Sean. Sean, for jumping in at the last minute. Uh, this was very uh, informative, and that hopefully people can get some, uh, some inspiration from it. Uh, are you available for personal inquiries? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the okay. things we've, we've done a lot of over the last last several years is have a lot of conversation with a lot of universities about our experiences. So we're more than happy to set up a call or, or have any kind of conversation um, anybody wants to have. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, I've got one person who raised their hand, but unfortunately, uh, we can't uh, hear you. So because of the webinar, so go ahead and type your question uh, into the chat. We'll see if we can uh, get to that quickly. Um, thank you for mentioning uh, Educause because uh, Trusted CI is going to many conferences in the upcoming year and uh, I've been trying to post some of the major talks that we're presenting on our on our homepage, trustedci.org. So uh, I believe that we're also going to be attending uh, Educause as well. Okay. So you'll be seeing some of us there. <laughs> All right, well, uh, the person who is raising their hand, if, uh, if we didn't address any of your questions, uh, why don't you go ahead and send me an email when I send around the links, and we could see if that could be addressed at some other time. But uh, for the rest of you, uh, well, for everyone, I just want to thank you uh, for, for joining this presentation. Uh, we will be uh, posting this video to YouTube later today, and so I'll be distributing it later. And uh, Preston and, and Sean, thanks again for coming to our, our web webinar. It was my pleasure. Thanks. All right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop uh, sharing. And I'm going to stop recording here.